Oh, hey, Tally. What are you doing? Oh, hi, Evie. I'm just having real difficulty with this treasure chest. Yeah, those puzzle chests can be really tough, eh? Yeah, seriously, this one is, like, particularly annoying. And what could it be? Honestly, I'm, like, so close to giving up right now. Taliesin, the word is valor. Yes! Oh, no. Oh, I really thought that was going to work. The word is honor. Uh, probably not, Saofang. No, we already know there's not an O for the second letter. That's kind of obvious. Oh, uh, then it might be tutor? You know what? It is! It's tutor! Hey, two ciphers. Nice. Thanks, dads. Telly, who are you talking to? Hmm? What? No one. What? Knowledge is power. Hello, Internet Taliesin here, and welcome to the Weekly Reset, Taliesin and Evertel's Wondrous Wisdom Show. And it occurs to me, Internet, that what with the cinematic analysis videos and getting used to the newborn in the house, that we haven't actually managed a proper Weekly Reset since Patch 9.2 released. So, as potentially the best ever Mythic Race to World First ragers in Sepulchre of the First Ones, and as we await the new expansion announcement on April the 19th, and as most of us have now seen the raid cinematics, and kind of, but not really, ending of the Shadowlands, and as we fly everywhere now, because that's a thing, I thought today's episode would be the perfect time to have a little catch up and offer an evaluation of Patch 9.2, now that we've had a handful of weeks to really see what it's all about. Because internet, I'm not gonna lie to you, opinions have been mixed. Beta of Azeroth strikes back. Let's be real. 9.2 is a whole heap of shit. Wow, gets worse and worse. 9.2 is the lowest yet. Zerith bored tis. Jafaka, that place is dumb. So here we are going to be giving you in handy list form, because this is the internet after all, everything that is good or sucks and I hate about 9.2. But first, the reason I know you're really here, the sepulchre of the first ones and the real race to world first, heroic, for guilds with a name a bit like Immortalis. The race that Liquid wish they could be a part of, but they can't because their name isn't a bit like Immortalis. And already, the real race is hotting up with the true, original, kind-hearted, excellent parents, People's Champions Immortalis, Argent Dawn EU. Yay! Making pretty solid progress towards our cutting edge in the last couple of sessions. Killing Oracle with the last pull of the raid on Sunday to sit at 4 out of 11 bosses killed. A figure which at the time of writing puts us first. We are leading the pack fam with nearest challenges Presidio Immortalis on two kills. That's half the amount of kills that we have, past champions Esther Mortalis and Norska Immortalis on one each and everyone else still progressing normal. So we're number one and look I know why that is, I'm not an idiot. I'd imagine all of these other Immortalises are probably focusing on normal clears to get their guys fully loaded up on tier sets, much like the world first for guilds with names not necessarily like Immortalis, otherwise known as the official race to world first, did, meaning that official world first mythic progression began on Tuesday with the farcical situation of none of the big contenders actually pulling a mythic boss for most of the day because they were so busy doing split runs in normal. That is some awesome loot rules you've got there, Blizz. Really good. So I'd expect these other immortalities to catch up pronto because we basically didn't bother with normal at all beyond our first raid night. We have no tier, but it's still nice to be in the front. Rest assured, we will be keeping you updated on this nail-biting race for probably the next few months. Oh, by the way, the raid, Sepulchre of the First Ones, both in my own experience and from what we've seen in the now thrilling Mythic Race, and I think the general community reception overall, absolute baller, fresh aesthetic, genuinely inventive and enjoyable bosses, super chill music out of combat and between pulls, which is actually a very important and underrated component of a raid, and the difference between it and Sanctum of Domination's constant, unrelenting, it's the Sanctum, Sanctum. Is important to know, I think. So Sepulchre, absolutely one of the things about 9.2 that I think is good. Because yes, we've started the list now. What's next? Everybody hates 
Lords of Dread. Oh no, I completely forgotten about this. Damn, yes, okay. There is one part of the raid that lots of people don't think is good actually. In fact, many people are very, very angry about it. And that is the Lords of Dread fight featuring Malganis and Contessa, or rather an interaction between those two that plays out as we enter the boss room in which basically they're having a mount off, but instead of mounts, they're taking forms of old bosses and NPCs from past expansions. Relatively obscure ones as well, to be honest, like Knight Captain Valiri from Tall de Gore, Wise Marie from the Jade Forest, that sort of level. Now, I don't want to talk for anyone else, but when I heard about this, I thought, ah, a cute little thing that shows Dreadlords taking forms of people we've met and often killed, because that is something that Dreadlords do. Maybe it's something they actually did in the past, and we can have some fun speculation, or maybe it's just these two messing with the player characters before the fight. Either way, it doesn't really matter, because it's just cute. And you know who agreed with me, Internet? The forums, where- No, the forums didn't agree with me, you idiots. It was a shit show, obviously. What the fish is this? God, get your hands off Warcraft! Shadowlands, how to kill an IP. It really hurts that this is what it's come to. Cultural vandalism, knee-jerk, face-slapping retcon from the depths of the cringe-verse. I, I quite like that one. Yeah, people hated this. I think most of all, because they took it as an implication that since the Dreadlords have been revealed to have been created by Sire Denathrius in Shadowlands, and Daddy D worked with the Jailer, for many this is another example of the Jailer's 5000 IQ, it was nipples all along mega plan, retconning the sanctity of past WoW lore with his insertion. And that is a frustration, honestly, I can completely understand. But I don't think this does that? Oh god. For a start, I think this is the two bosses messing with us, which is very in character. Earlier in Zerith Mortis, Malganis was going around as us, giving the Shadowlands forces the wrong orders and making everyone very angry at us. It was very upsetting. This is the easiest to explain and therefore most likely answer, and you know how much I love the easy answer. So I was already fine with that, even before the literal designer of the fight clarified on Twitter that this was indeed the case. But let's really steel man this one, okay? Because I think it's worth doing. Even if these two really have taken the form of all of these NPCs and Aladdin's tortured twin blades loot from the fight is definitely evidence that they genuinely took the form of at least one of them, Alidian, would that even be the massive retcon that people are complaining about? Because I don't think it would. We have killed everyone on this list and none of them turned into dreadlords when we did. So objectively, they were not dreadlords when we fought them, meaning that our characters' entire interactions with them have not changed at all. If Dreadlords ever did take these forms, it was at some other time, for some other reason, which could have been a massive long-term deception, but which just as likely could have been because they needed to look like a certain person to get through a certain door and see some plans or whatever. And none of this is inserting the Jailer into the past lore, because frankly, the Dreadlords don't work for the Jailer. For proof, when Denathrius, their true boss, was captured by us, and so Vanus asked Soval what he was going to do about it, he says categorically nothing. Daddy D has served his purpose. The Dreadlords rescued Denathrius against Zoval's orders anyway, because they don't answer to him. My favourite comment on this topic is, I fishing hate everything about this because it also likely means there's even more NPCs out there that were other Dreadlords. And like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> the whole point of the Nethrazim is that they disguise themselves all the time and that they are good at it. If every single time that a Dreadlord had disguised themselves as someone was one of the times that we found out about it, then by definition, they would be shit at it. So yeah, there are loads of NPCs that we have met in WoW that probably were Dreadlords, either for the whole time we knew them or for a short while. That's just simply always been true and it's not a retcon. Anyway, people hated it. I'm sure they will carry on hating it no matter what I think. I think it's harmless and I think it's fun and I like fun. So let's get back to the list. What is something I like about this god-awful shitty patch? I like... Zerath Mortis. Yeah, the new zone is great. It's been three weeks, so you all know by now, and I'm not going to bang on about it, but it is such a breath of fresh air, aesthetically, thematically, and at the moment, I'd probably go as far as to say that it is the best example of the WoW max level adventure grindy zone that they have ever managed, and I include Timeless Isle in that list. I think the thing that makes it so good for me is that I'm going to hit Revered with the Enlightened in the next day or two, in plenty of time for the 
double legendary memory becoming available next reset, and I have never once so far felt like the reputation grind was something that I needed to do, or even why I was logging in in the first place. I've played WoW most days since 9.2 released, and every time I have always looked forward to logging in, because I know I'm going to enjoy running around this zone just doing stuff. There was criticism in the first week that beyond the story, there just weren't many world quests and other things to actually complete every day. And that's true. It is a criticism that I understand and that I agree with, but I'd be lying if Xerath Mortis Feels Empty accurately described my experience. Because in the course of completing the daily serving of Xerath Mortis action, I always also end up killing rares, grabbing treasures, joining a group to do an achievement or whatever, to the extent that a play session always takes me a lot longer than I think it's going to. And the zone has only become even more full of things to do as time has gone on, as I've unlocked the Jiro dailies and the Protoform Synthesis Builder Mount Workshop. Basically, I have never had a bad time in Xerath Mortis. I think it's got the single best marrying of visuals and incredible music that I've seen in the game since, like, Grizzly Hills. And it's a zone and an experience experience that I already know I'm going to look back on incredibly fondly in the future. Yes, in my opinion, Xerath Mortis is a big, juicy win, but it's not perfect. Oh no, because here's gripes I have. No, actually, here is some things I hate about Xerath Mortis. This one chest in Provis Fauna, which every day appears on my mini-map, and every day I think, oh great, a chest, and veer off course to get it, and then every day I see it and go, oh no, it's this f thing, because this is the chest that needs a provost key to open. Do I look like someone who knows what a provost key is or where to get it? Do I look like someone who has time to do a single Google search and find out? No, you're right, no! So unless I get a provost key for my birthday or something, this chest is going to continue to taunt me until the day I die. I also hate the way that Coco Pop, my little robot buddy, keeps taking their hat off. Like, I know it's just a little thing, but like, I've got all these hats for you, Coco Pop, and like, I chose a nice hat for you to put on, Pops, and I did that so that I could admire how dashing you look, not so that you could take it off again every time I ask you to help me open a chest or use a console or for any other reason. And you know what? That goes for when I make you pilot a little spider or snail or something, and I spend Coco Pop energy to do that, and then three seconds later when I fly somewhere and you decide to get out of the spider to follow me, and thanks for that, you dickhead. Yeah, that was a good use of Coco Pop energy, wasn't it? That made me feel brilliant. And another thing, how come I always manage to click on Coco Pop accidentally when I don't mean to, but when I want to click on him to tell him to do something that he probably won't do anyway. He is always annoyingly just out of reach. What kind of evil robot are you, Coco Pop? I do like his flying disc thing though, fair play. Another thing I hate, the cipher of the first one. Okay, this one's a bit unfair because I don't hate it, but there was one super annoying thing about it that did not get changed despite constant feedback and therefore deserves to be criticised. And that, as you know, is the stupid mobile game timers on the big initial cipher unlocks. Except worse, because at least with a mobile game, they make stupid timers to try and get money off you to make them go faster. You can't pay to skip cipher times, so it's literally just in the game to piss you off for no reason. But worse than that, I think that those timers are one of the main reasons that the 9.2 experience felt empty to a lot of players in the first week. Because that first week before Season 3 kicked off should have been prime cipher time for all of us. We should have been farming currency and gleefully upgrading it and changing our Coco Pop appearances, unlocking the Build Amount workshop and starting to collect everything that we need for that, and just generally enjoying ourselves. But instead, we were either sat there waiting for the four and six days timers to count down, or we were panicking because we were behind on ciphers and hadn't even put the timers on yet, and knew that we'd have to wait even longer for those fun things to be unlocked. And even worse than that, it meant that most people didn't even have a choice in the order that they unlocked stuff on the cipher. Because for anyone who's ever played a video game before, obviously you unlock the ones with long timers first, right? Which meant that in those first weeks, you missed out on the glorious smorgasbord of options that the cipher later turned into. It was silly, Blizz. Don't do it again. Right, something I like. I like the cipher of the first ones. Yes, yeah, psych. Okay, so the timers were dumb, but there's something about the cipher that I love, and it's not really the world effects that you unlock, which are 
fine. They're fine. It's not even the mount thing, even though that's good and probably the only reason I'll even be going into the zone after the next month or so. No, I'm talking about the quest lines that unexpectedly popped with certain cipher unlocks, which is exactly the kind of thing this system needs and that I want to see even more of if something like the cipher is iterated on in future content. Because, and this is another thing I like, the questing in 9.2 across the board is great. I thought the initial Zerith Mortis unlock stuff was really characterful and cool. The cipher unlocked quests with the Jiro and the Automa are perfect and some of the best stuff in the patch. And I think generally the campaign stuff has been really good too. I thought the creation of the Crown of Wills doubling as a major therapy session for characters that had been controlled by domination magic, so Bolvar, Mograine, Anduin and Sylvanas, was about as deftly and elegantly handled as you can handle something that is probably a little bit beyond WoW's traditional storytelling capabilities. And yeah, the Crown of Wills doesn't look cool, does it? But I'm still talking about things I like. And I especially enjoyed this week's instalment that saw us use our last day without flying to unlock and portal our way up to an inaccessible peak of the zone and grab a new Arbiter body. Oh, and the in-game cutscenes we've had this patch to help tell that story? Top draw. This week's Doctor Strange dream sequence being a particular highlight. But not all cinematics have been so well received. Oh, no, 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 no. I hate the cinematics. This isn't true either, I don't hate the cinematics. You can get my full detailed breakdown on both of them in the two videos we put out in the last couple of weeks. I actually love the Anduin raid cinematic where we see the final moments of the remains of Arthas Menethil. I'm not so crazy about the real raid ending cinematic though, and I feel I've made my reasons for that pretty clear too. But like the Malganis thing, I think there's definitely an element of the community using the raid ending as a lightning rod for their justifiable frustrations with the game and story as a whole. And whereas I'm not sure how helpful that is as criticism, and I'd probably try and avoid doing that, it is nevertheless an understandable reaction. The Jailer has not been a great antagonist. We haven't seen anywhere near as much of the Shadowlands as we hoped. Like, remember before the expansion started and they said, yeah, the great thing about this place is there's unlimited zones and aesthetics, and then the only other place we ever saw before now was the Moor, but yellow. And I don't care how much they say they always plan to only have two major patches, there does definitely feel like there's something in the middle missing, doesn't there? Like, not WAD-level whole missed chapters, but just something. I can understand why people are down on the overall story of the Shadowlands, basically, especially when it comes to the Jailer and his backstory and motivations. Things I think Blizzard know themselves, but haven't shared in anywhere near a satisfying enough way. I think it's quite clear that the writers see the resolution of the Sylvanas arc as being the main plot of Shadowlands, and that is still to come. Notably, the final campaign chapter that was never tested on the PTR, titled Judgment, <laughs> still Still doesn't feature in the quest list on live at the time of writing. Next week's tying up of the Arbiter loose end is the official end of the story in 9.2. It's probably safe to assume that missing judgment chapter will get shifted to 9.25 instead. Honestly, I would be totally okay with 9.25 judgment if that gives them a chance to make Sylvanas' resolution bigger and better and more involved than it would otherwise have been. Absolutely, but I'm not sure how well the community will react to 9.2, the climax of Shadowlands after all, closing out on Arbiter stuff and not even addressing the Sylvanas question, which is not so much the elephant in the room right now as the blue whale in the room. The blue whale being the biggest animal that ever lived in the history of Earth ever. It's a big question is what I'm trying to say. I guess we'll just have to come back next week and find out what people thought, which is fine because we're a weekly show. I like the new great vault changes that Blizzard have introduced this week. The attendance tokens that you receive if there's nothing that takes your fancy from your gear choices have been reworked so that you can now get up to six per week depending on how many slots in the vault you unlock. And these can now be used to purchase gold caches, account bound renown tokens, genesis motes for mount building, ciphers of the first ones, enlightened reputation, and gem slots for applicable season three gear. Which is all genuinely great, fair play, and will be something that people will especially appreciate later on in the patch when there are inevitably less gear upgrades appearing for them in the vault. There are also buffs to the drop rate of sand-worn relics too, which are frankly useless. I hate sand-worn relic gear, I hate it so much. This shit still makes no sense. I have no idea what sand-worn relic gear is for. Even with the buffs, no one is ever going to get enough relics to buy more than one or two pieces before their cipher is unlocked.
unlocked enough that all other gear that drops in Zerith Mortis is higher item level than this stuff anyway. And it's bind on pickups, so you can't even send it to alts. I am genuinely baffled as to what purpose this serves. I think you should make it usable in the creation catalyst that opens in a couple of weeks. The thing that uses some of the ocean of flux that you've got in your currency tab to turn season three gear into tier pieces, which currently doesn't have an option for open world gear. It all comes from raid, mythic dungeons, or PVP. This could be the open world catalyst compatible gear, and then we'd all know what it's for, but it's not. No one knows what it's for. I like... Torghast. Look fam, Torghast has a bad rep, but the Jather's Gauntlet is awesome. I'm convinced there is a very important lesson here, because I think it's fair to say Torghast was not a massive success in the eyes of much of the player base. And the thing that killed it as a gameplay mode for most people was the fact that you had to do it exactly twice a week. No more, no less, to get the very important Soul Ash rewards. But the best, most enjoyable iterations of Torghast have been the versions where you're not doing that. The Twisting Corridor, and the gauntlet are what Torghast should have been all along. Optional side gameplay that you complete in your own time for the fun and the challenge and some cool cosmetics and the satisfaction of the achievement. I honestly think that if Shadowlands had launched with no other version of Torghast but just the Twisting Corridors and then gauntlet was added alongside it in 9.1 and then there was a different Torghast mode this patch, everyone would love it. I know as a game dev there must be a temptation to force players into the new content that you've worked really hard on because you've worked really hard on it, I get that. But honestly, would you feel more fulfilled as a dev if everyone played a new thing or if everyone enjoyed it. Like we said on this show, when Torghast hit the beta, not everything benefits from having power rewards and the inevitable limitations that brings attached to them. Sea Warfronts and Islands for another excellent example. And so it has proven with Torghast, I think. Honestly, Blizz, I'm going to let you into a secret here. You can make any new gameplay mode you like, and putting important player power behind it has proven to generally make everyone hate it. The only thing you have to do to get everyone to play your new thing is to offer a class-specific, unique weapon of Appearance. That's literally all you've got to do. Seriously, we are so basic, that is all we need. We will play your new thing, and we will bloody love it, mate. But the gauntlet, genuinely good fun. More like that, please. Oh, by the way, it goes without saying that, as always, there are going to be links to Wowhead articles on everything we talk about in this episode in the description below. And more besides. Like, do you know if you are on course to hit revered reputation with the Enlightened before the double legendaries come next week? Well, Wowhead, no. All in all, then, yeah, I'm really happy with 9.2. It's given me a lot of fun and I think it will continue to do so for a reasonable amount of time. It is legitimately, in my opinion, a high point of the expansion and it's full of gameplay philosophies I would be really happy to see continued and iterated on in the next expansion. I think this is the best they've done a new zone rep with the Enlightened. I think the concept of the Cypher and most of the execution as being this non-power related cool thing is great. I think most of the patch is pretty user friendly, if not as much as I'd like to see it become, but it's a clear improvement and to the extent that I am willing to believe there has been a fundamental change in philosophy just like Team 2 say. I guess we'll find out on April the 19th when the new expansion is revealed, but in the meantime, thanks for joining us today for this catch-up session of the Weekly Reset. I think we've got a handle on the whole new baby stuff now, so we should be getting back to more regular output again soon. So you know, I look forward to seeing more of you both here and on the stream. If you like this video, don't thank us, thank our patrons who give their actual real life money to make all of our work happen. And guys, seriously, thank you, especially these last couple of months. We could not have done anything without you. If you didn't like it, downvote the shit out of it. And remember, my name is Anirin. <laughs> I'm the worst father. No, my name is Taliesin from me and Evertel and the other two whose names I can't remember now. Until next time, cheerio.